All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to 5.2, and I know that you have some questions on 5.1, but we'll probably do go over that homework tomorrow. Um, 5.2, there are some parts that are kind of kind of weird-ish. Um, when I was doing them yesterday, it took me like till the end to be like, okay, got it. So I skipped one that I was like, I'm not sure. Because like I told you, when the book works it out, they don't do every step. So I want to make sure that I give you every step. And then I was like screwing it up because I wasn't, I wasn't in the mindset to do it. But we're good today. Um, sigma notation, you guys learned in pre-calc. And I, I get it. Again, <laughs> we're in that, that watered down situation. But the sigma notation just means that it's a summation. So you just keep adding in a series. That's all you do. So this only gets complicated when you start throwing like some crazy functions in there. So the very first page is really kind of simple. And then it gets, like I said, a little more complicated as you go. Um, and again, if it takes all period to do this, because this is pretty, I mean, it's pretty long. We'll go over 5-1 homework tomorrow at the beginning, and then you'll have your homework just like we normally do. Okay. So don't stress out. And I'm sorry if it's not all period like lecture, just realize that you're going to get that day back. Okay. So sigma notation, in the preceding section, you studied anti-differentiation. In this section, you will look further into a problem introduced in section 2.1, that of finding the area of a region in the plane. At first glance, these two ideas, may seem unrelated, but you will discover in section 5.4 that they are closely related by an extremely important theorem called the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this fundamental theorem of calculus is one of the things that you're tested on on the AP exam. Um, you had a fundamental theorem of algebra that you knew, but you didn't know it was called that. So once we get closer to the AP exam, we'll keep, keep hashing over this stuff. This section begins by introducing a concise notation for sums. This notation is called sigma notation because it uses the uppercase Greek letter sigma. Which just like, looks like a pointy E. And you guys can see that's all over it. Like I said, the very first page is pretty simple. So your sigma notation, the sum of N terms. A1, A2. A3, all the way to your very last one, which would be AN. Is written as, so the little sigma symbol, on the bottom, you're gonna have your index or your I. In this case, this one is gonna be equal to one. That means we start with one. Uh, if it had A equals zero, it would start with zero. So wherever it is like your initial, it's whatever you start with. And then the top number is what you go to. So if it said four, you would go one to four. So you would do four terms of this, okay? So the, the bigger the number, the more work you're gonna be doing. So understand that, okay? Uh, whatever your function is, in this case, we're gonna write A sub I. All that means is you're going to plug in the one for the I right there to start with. So your first term. Then you're going to keep moving up until you get to N. So I'll move it up by one is two, three, and I can keep going forever until I finish out with whatever that N is. So again, your index, your lower limit, and your upper limit. It's going to be what, how many terms that you have. So if it said one to four, you would do A1, A2, A3, A4. Everybody understand? All right. I is the index of summation. A 
A sub R is the ith term of the sum. And the upper and lower bounds of summation are one and one. And those are, I actually reversed those on accident. So one would be your lower because it's on the bottom of the summation and n is your upper because it's on the top. They were on the other side. All right, so examples of sigma notation. So it says simplify, we're gonna go from one to six and we're just plugging in for i. So i is your function, there is no function except for your variable or your number. So we would do one, we're gonna add the next one, which is two, add three, add four, add five, add six, because we go from one to six. I don't need you to add it through, it's just showing you how to set it up, okay? So you can add it if you want to division and point them up. All right? The next one, here's our function, i plus one. We're gonna start at zero and finish up at five. So I plus one, we're gonna change that to zero plus one. It's a summation, so we add. I is gonna to change to one because we're in the next term. Then two plus one, then three plus one, four plus one, and our upper limit is five. which gives you one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. Again, in a, in a real summation situation, you're gonna go ahead and add those together, but we don't have to. This is just kind of showing you how to set it up. All right, so what's the difference in C? Okay, what else? It's J, so it's not I, but it's still the same thing. We can have N, K, R, P, it doesn't matter. It's just any variable. What else? Starts at three and goes to seven. So we're gonna take that function J squared. We're gonna start with three, so three squared. We're gonna add four squared, five squared, six squared, and we're gonna stop at seven squared. So it is the exact same thing. D just has a different function. It does have a different variable. That variable does not, it doesn't matter what that variable is. Uh, in your calculator, we'll always use X. So we have one to five. So we're gonna rewrite it. One over the square root of one. One over the square root of two. One over the square root of three. One over the square root of four and one over the square root of five. So what we're gonna see more of is E and F, okay, E and F. So those are the E, A through D, you saw in pre-cal. That's what you did in pre-cal. So calculus is gonna take it a little step further. And you have that one divide N to the outside, and then you have K squared plus one. This is gonna be a general one because you go to the end. You don't go to like five, seven, nine, anything like that. So this is gonna be general. So here's how it works. We don't know what N is. So we're just gonna write the one, one over N. They say we're gonna start with K equals one. So in our function, one squared plus one. So all I did was rewrite this with K equal to one. So I got it. You're going to keep going, except for this time, k is going to equal 2. We will keep going. Why do I write the little dots? Because again, it's not a finite. That means it's going to keep going forever and ever because we don't know what n is until we get to k is n. So our top bound is n. And that's it. 
Okay. A lot of times you're not going to get a specific number answer. You're going to end up with something like this. Okay. So it don't stress out. We're also going to bring the limit back that we did last chapter. So what, what's the limit of one third? One third. What's the limit of one over n? Zero. Remember when we had to do that, where we simplified it out, we divided by the highest power on the bottom and reduced it or whatever. That's going to come back in here too. So you're kind of doing the same thing and bringing in some old stuff. All right. So look at F. You're going to see this a lot. Okay. F of X, I is just your function. So whatever function they give you, they might give you X squared, X to the third. They might give you two X plus five, whatever. That's your function. Your delta X is going to be the change in your X values. So we're going to talk about area in a minute. And the way that they find area under a curve is they make a bunch of rectangles. Okay. So why would you make rectangles? It's easy to find the area based on height or when it comes to width. And then um, it's either going to be an over and under estimate. We'll talk about that again in a minute. But your delta X is how you split it up. So how many triangles would you have? What's the what's the variation in the, not triangles but rectangles? All right. So again, we'll talk about this in a minute. But we're going to have f of x one because your i starts at one. Delta x. You'll go up to two, and you'll keep going until you get to your upper boundary in. And that's as good as this one I get. Now, again, I'm going to take this really, really slow. So if it takes a whole period, it's fine if we need to finish it up tomorrow. That's fine as well. I'm not trying to rush this one because some of this is a little bit complicated to like comprehend. Okay. Make sure that you ask questions, even if you feel like it's a dumb question. Please ask because somebody else probably knows that question too. Okay. Everybody okay with this front page? All right. Although any variable can be used as the index of summation. I, J, and K are often used. Notice in the previous example that the index of summation does not appear in the terms of the expanded sum. So sometimes you don't have the I, the J, and the K. The properties of summation shown below can be derived using the associative And commutative properties of addition and the distributive property of addition over multiplication. In the first property, K is a constant. Give you a minute to copy that. There we go. All right. So your first property, and guys, you'll use these, and especially the theorem 5.2, those summation formulas, we're going to use these throughout the whole note. So those are another thing that you're going to have to memorize. Okay, they are specific to this. So yesterday on our homework, the one that was kind of tripping us up was like one over X. And we got to remember that the integral of one over X is that LN absolute value of X. So we try to make it X to the negative one. So we'll talk about that again tomorrow or whenever I go over that 5.1 homework, but watch all those formulas. So I would have your cheat sheet out and make sure that, that you know, it's not something easier than what you're making it out to be. So while I was going through this, like I wrote these down and just kind of, Kind of put them off to the side, but you really have to use them throughout these notes. So these are going to be very important, especially these four. So on this first one, it's just like anything else. We can take that constant out. And just do the summation of AI.
And then when you're adding or subtracting, so just like the integrals, we took the constant out of the integral. Does everybody remember doing that on five one? So if it was like two x, we took the two out and we just integrated x, right? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So we had like this the integration of two x. We left that two alone, but we only integrated x. So that was two x squared over two, like that. Does everybody remember? So this is the same way. Summation is no different. So when we have them added or subtracted, you can split them up. So each term will summation, we'll do the summation of each term. So on this, we would do AI by itself. And then we would add the summation or subtract the summation of VI. So you can split them up. The next theorem lists some useful formulas for sums of powers. And like I said, these are very important. So we'll keep referencing that to them. So the summation of a constant is going to be Cn where C is a constant. So anytime they ask you to do like the summation of two, it's gonna be two times whatever your in or your upper bound is. All right, the second one for I, it's gonna be N, N plus one over two. The summation of I squared is N, N plus one, 2N plus one over six. And then I cubed is N squared times N plus one squared over four. Right. So evaluating a sum, it says evaluate the summation from one to n of i plus one over n squared for n equal to 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. So we're going to simplify it and make it general within this little space, and then we'll plug in in this chart. Okay. So we're going to start. n squared is going to be a constant, so we can rewrite it. as one over n squared times the summation of i plus one. With our rules, since we have an addition right there, we can rewrite it again as the summation of i plus the summation of one, again from one to n. Everybody okay so far? Everything else is rules that we just looked at at the top. So I'm gonna pull this down a little bit. I'm gonna let y'all copy that and then I'm gonna pull it down so I can see those rules real fast. So what is your summation of I? Plus, what's your summation of a constant? Cn, your constant times n. So one times n is one n. Is everybody okay with that? Again, these two were rules from up here. Now all you have to do is simplify. Okay, so we're gonna make this more simple. So what can we do? 
I'm going to go ahead and clean this up. So I'm going to leave this one over n squared out for a minute. I'm going to distribute this in. What can I do now? How can I get these together? What's your common denominator? That so gives me n squared plus n plus 2n over my common denominator 2. Is everybody okay with that part? Again, to put n over 2, you have to put a 2 on top. So 2n over 2 is what we have on the end. Clean it up. We have n squared plus 3n over 2. What can I do now? Multiply straight across. That'll be fun. So n squared plus 3n over 2n squared. I can take out an n from the top and the bottom. So if I take out an n, I get n plus 3 over 2n squared. And then your n and your square will cancel out. Is there anything else I can think about? I feel like this is the hardest part, the simplification, okay? Especially when it gets into like your uh, I squares or even your I cubes. Okay. This is perfect. Now you can evaluate the sum by substituting. The appropriate values of N as shown in the table below. So we're gonna use our calculator. And we have 10 plus three over two times 10. Does everybody understand where that's coming from? I'm just plugging 10 into what we got. And we get 13 over 20 if you want it as a decimal at 0 0.65. So I'm gonna write both of them down, 13 over 20. Or 0 0.65, whichever one that you want. We're going to do the same thing, except for instead of 10, we're doing 100. And we get 103 over 200, which is 0 0.515. I don't care which one you give me decimals or fractions, that's fine. If I keep going and I plug in a thousand, the decimal is going to be 50150. And then for 10,000, All right, so a lot of this is going to be simplifying down to this. Okay, like I said, I stopped. This next page is super, super easy. It's just a lot of fill in the blank. And then when we get into the next couple, just pay attention to how I'm getting at everything. Okay. All right, in the table, note that the sum appears to approach a limit as n increases. Although the discussion of limits at infinity. Here in section 4.5 applies to a variable x, where x can be any real number. Many of the same results hold true for limits involving the variable n. So I told you those limits were going to come back in. Where n is restricted to positive inner value, integer values. So to find the limit. 
of that function that we finished with. We had n plus three on the top divided by two n on the bottom. So again, that came from the previous page. As n approaches infinity, you can write the limit as n approaches infinity of n plus three over two n This should not be anything new to you, okay? The limit as n approaches infinity of n over 2n plus 3 over 2n. We can reduce the n over 2n to be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 half plus three over two n. What's your limit of one half? What's your limit of three over two n? Which gives us one half. And if you look at that chart, it kept going, like it kept adding zeros in there. So it'd be 0 0.500 zero some decimals, 0 0.500 zero zero some, some other numbers. Okay, so it definitely was going to 0.5. All right. So area, in Euclidean geometry, the simplest type of plane region is a rectangle. And although people often say that the formula for the area of a rectangle is area equals base times height, e to be length times width, it doesn't matter. It is actually more proper to say that this is the definition not the formula, the definition of the area of a rectangle. So from this definition, you can develop formulas for the areas of many other plane regions, for example, to determine the area of a triangle. You can form a rectangle whose area is twice that of the triangle. So if you had this triangle, you could make it into a rectangle. The area you could find lengths come to it and divide it by two. Everybody understand that? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Once you know how to find the area of a triangle, you can determine the area of any polygon by subdividing. the polygon into triangular regions. So you did this in math two, if you were trying to find the area of like a hexagon, you split it into six triangles or an octagon you split into eight triangles, you found the area of one of the triangles and then multiply it by eight or multiply it by six. Okay, if you don't remember that, you did it, okay? All right, finding the area of the regions other than polygons, Is more difficult. The ancient Greeks used the exhaustion method. Essentially, the method is a limiting process in which the area is squeezed between two polygons. When inscribed, what does inscribed mean? inside. So if you had a circle and you were trying to find the area, they would put something inside of that circle in the region and one circumscribed. Circumscribed means on the outside. Because they don't, okay, so like a random polygon like not a square, not a rectangle, not something that we have an actual formula for. If they had to find that area, they would use other figures that they did know to fill up the inside 
and then take up a little bit of the outside and then find the middle of that. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that. It's not as complicated as you think it is, I promise, okay? The worst part is reducing those like I squares and stuff like that. So that's the worst part, I feel like. All right, a process that is similar to this is used to determine the area of a plane region. Um, uh, it's used in the remaining examples in the section. That's not weird. I don't know what's happening. The area of a plane region, recall from section 2.1, that the origins of calculus are connected to two classic problems, the tangent line problem and the area problem. The next example begins the investigation of the area. So we've already done tangent lines with derivatives and stuff like that. So now we're doing the area. All right, so Mackenzie, this might answer your question a little bit better. So if you have this curve, you don't have a formula to come up with the exact area. Does everybody understand that? So what they do is they inscribe. So notice in the first one, it's inside the curve. And then they circumscribe or write outside. See how the rectangles go outside? And then they find an area between. So they'll say that the area is between this, this is the least it could be, and this is the greatest it could be. So your area is somewhere in there. So it's an estimate. Can they get a really good estimate? Yes. How do they get a really good estimate? Make more rectangles. Do I understand that? Okay. The more rectangles you use or the smaller the rectangles, the more blank space like this uh, will, will not be happening. Is that good? All right, so I know it sounds like it's gonna be crazy. It's really not that bad. Use the five rectangles in the figures below to find two approximations of the area of the region lying between the graph of the f of x equals negative x squared plus five and the x-axis between zero and two. So it's already labeled that out for you guys. So these, this one is gonna use right endpoints. And you'll see that again soon. So this one's going to use right endpoints. This one is going to use left endpoints. All right, so why is it left and right endpoints? If we look at our rectangle, the point that touches the actual curve is the right side of the rectangle. Does that make sense? On um, this one, when you overestimate, it's the left side of the rectangle that's touching the curve. Got it? All right, so that's different from left and right. So your right endpoints on this one for your delta x is going to be two fifths i. In a few minutes, I'll explain to you exactly how to get that. But that again is, if you look, we have two fifths, four fifths, six fifths, eight fifths. So I got it. So all of those, two fifths times one, two fifths times two, two fifths times three, two fifths times four. That's where this is coming from. Now, there's a way to get that. We'll get there in a minute, okay? So then we're doing the summation. Of I equal to one. It can equal anything it wants to, but we're always going to use one for right now, unless they tell us something different, like start at zero, start at three. So right now, everything is one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So then how many rectangles do we have? Five. So our N is going to be five. So the next thing that you're going to do, remember on that last example that we had um, of our summations, we had that F, X, I, and then times delta X. That's exactly the formula that we're going to use right here. So you would do F of two-fifths I, and your delta X, sorry, this is your function. This is your X. Your delta X is going to be the change in your, like, what's the spacing? It's just going to be two fifths. Sorry, y'all. 
if you're writing in piano, I apologize. All right. So let me let me explain what this is again. Everybody's okay with the one and five, right? Okay. So five is the number of rectangles that we use. We're gonna take our function and we're gonna plug in two fifths i. What is our function? Mm -mm. What is our function? Negative right, negative x squared uh, plus five. And then our i is, or our x is two fifths i. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Then it says multiply that all by delta x, or what is your change in your x-axis? And that is by two fifths, all right? So here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna do the summation from five to one. I'm gonna make some brackets instead of using 50,000 parentheses. You set our function, and I'm gonna rewrite it right here just so you guys can see it. It's right here, right here as well, and right here as well. We're gonna write our function x squared, negative x squared plus five, but we're gonna plug in two fifths i uh, for our x. So negative. 2i over 5 squared plus 5. And then we're going to multiply that by 2 fifths. Everybody understand what I did? All right. So I struggled putting this in my calculator, but I'm going to try it one more time. I did it like 50 times. I want to show you how to do it in your calculator so you don't have to write out 50 terms, okay? So it's not 50, it's five terms. But how would we do this? We would start by plugging in one. So two over five squared, negative plus five times two fifths. Plus, then we would plug in two. Then we would plug in three. Then we plug in four. Then we plug in five. That's a long time, right? That's a lot of work. So I want to show you in your calculator. Now, I'm going to tell you that this one is kind of weird how you put it in. So if I screw it up, I'm sorry. It all has to do with parentheses, okay? So it'll be the way that I put my parentheses in. And I'm gonna tell you, I did it 40 times yesterday and I got it right maybe twice out of the 40 times that I did it. Not a normal function, just this one, just this problem specifically. So you're gonna go to math, go to math. And if you go up to zero, there's a summation. So if you need that, yeah, if you need to write that on your paper, go ahead and do that. So math. And up to summation. And when I enter, it'll show you exactly what you mean. Okay, so the hard part is putting the function in. So on the bottom, we always use x because that's the only variable that we really have in our calculator. And we're going from one to five. I would suggest that you try to do this on your calculator right now. And if you don't have a calculator, go get it. I know that seems elementary, but these are not easy to put in. All right, so we're gonna put our function in. I'm gonna put a parenthesis because I have a bracket right here. Like I said, I'm gonna try real hard. I'm gonna do alpha y equals two x over five. Close it, squared plus five, close it. And then two fifths in parentheses. I'm gonna try. I, this one is weird because it has so many parentheses. Let me make it a little bit bigger for you. When you hit enter, did you get an answer? About 16 years. <laughs> so, anyway, right. Good. If you notice, parentheses go away when you hit enter. So we don't have as many parentheses up here as we did before. They just take them away. I don't know why. But anyway, 
So, so we get 6.48 and that saves you some time of having to do term after term after term after term. Everybody got it? Okay. So back, back out. Did you get it or no? Is everybody okay? All right. So what this means is that the area under the curve is 6.48 using those specific rectangles, so the inscribed rectangles. We're gonna do it again on the other side. How would we get the left endpoints? How would we get the left endpoints? So when we get those, they're gonna be two fifths times I minus one, because we're going backwards. Typically, you're always going to use the right side. It's not a big deal. Uh, you can use both. It might ask you to do both. But again, there's a way to find all this. All right, so we're going to do our summation again. It's the same exact thing. We have five rectangles. We're going to start at one. For our function, I'm going to simplify this for you and distribute this out, which gives you 2i minus 2 over 5. And then we still have that same 2 fifths difference in your x's. So 2 fifths, 4 fifths, 6 fifths, 8 fifths. So it's the difference in your rectangles. It's the width of your rectangles. So this is delta X or the change in X. So two fifths, two fifths, two fifths, two fifths. So eventually you'll make your own. So you'll see it. Like I said, you'll see it in just a minute. We have to plug that two I minus two into our function. So our function is gonna be negative. 2i minus 2 over 5 squared plus 5. Times 2 fifths. I showed you how to put it in. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this is 8.08. So what that tells you. 6.48 is less than the area of the curve, which is less than 8.08, which means the actual area of the curve falls between 6.48 and 8.08. So how did I tell you you could get closer to the true value? What did I tell you? Use more rectangles. So that means change your delta x. Is everybody good? All right, upper and lower sums, the procedure used. Um, Used in the last example can be generalized as follows. Consider a plane region bounded above by the graph of a non-negative. Continuous function. The region is bounded below by the x-axis. and the left and right boundaries of the region are the vertical lines x equals a and x equals b. To approximate the area of the region, begin by subdividing. The 
the interval a b into n sub intervals so what this means is find out how many rectangles you're going to use find out how big they are so the way that you find that or the delta x is you're going to do b minus a over n the endpoints of the intervals are a plus zero delta x less than a plus one delta x less than a plus two delta x and it will keep going until you get to in whatever your upper is. There's more to write with this. This term is A equals X sub zero. This one is x sub one, so your first term. This one would be x two, and the last one is going to be x n, but it would be equal to b. So whatever you have, so you would start with your a, end with your b. Because f is continuous, the extreme value theorem. guarantees the existence of a minimum and a maximum. Value of f of x in each sub interval. All right, so KP, when I write this, it does matter. Okay. For the minimum, it's going to be a lowercase m, and for the maximum, it's going to be an uppercase m. So it is not interchangeable. It is specific to that. So f of little m i, little m sub i, is the minimum value. of f of x in the i sub interval it's whatever your term is you don't know it could be 40. it's like the nth term you've heard of nth term right okay So then a capital M is going to be the maximum value. And then all of that is exactly the same. Next, define an inscribed rectangle. lying inside the ith subregion. Okay, so just a general subregion. So it doesn't matter. So like if we're looking at the rectangles, if we're looking at the rectangles, say we, the first one would be the first, then the second, those are the eyes, the different ones. Okay. All right. And a circumscribed rectangle. Extending outside the Ike subregion The height of the Ike inscribed rectangle is 
is f of little m i or the minimum. And the height of the ike circumscribed rectangle is f capital M sub i, the maximum. All right, so one more time, if I flip back, you don't have to. This would be the minimum height of this rectangle. This would be the maximum height. That's all it's saying. So inside is going to be min, outside is going to be maximum because it's an overestimate compared to an underestimate. So for each I, the area of the inscribed rectangle. is less than or equal to the area of the circumscribed rectangle. So then right here, the area of the inscribed rectangle is equal to the minimum function times delta x, which is exactly what we worked with a minute ago, which should be less than or equal to the maximum times delta x, and that would be the area of the circumscribed rectangle. And again, all it's getting you to understand is that it's under the curve, it's a minimum or it's lower. If it's above the curve, it's maximum and it's extra or it's upper. All right, so the sum of the areas of the inscribed rectangles. What is wrong? So it's called a lower sum and the sum of the areas of the circumscribed. Rectangles is called an upper sum. So again, just some figures that go along with all of that verbiage on this page. Like stats is coming back. All right. So again, all of this is the area inscribed is going to be less than the actual area and then uh, circumscribed is going to be actually over the area. This, if you could touch every point, would be the exact area. So that's all that figure is showing you. So finding the upper and lower sums for a region. Uh, this is the one that I wanted to die on. I just want to know. It, it's not bad. I just was not in the right. I was just not in the right mindset. I did when I sat down and I actually like wanted to do it, it was fine. But again, it's the space in between where they write like, oh, it's this equals this. And I'm like, well, y'all are not gonna know how to get from here to here. And then I kept making stupid little mistakes and erase and make another mistake and erase. And eventually I stopped writing the sentence on the writing pencil. So that's how stressful it was, but it was good. I was also really tired of showing it in the evening. 
So find the upper and lower sums for the region bounded by the graph of f x equals x squared and the x axis between zero and two. So zero and two is that interval a b. Does everybody understand? So if you need to write that, the interval a b is going to be zero to two. So we want to partition into sub intervals. That's going to be your delta x. Remember your del delta x. Your delta x was b minus a over n, which will be two minus zero over n or two. Write small, please, because there's a lot to go in here. Okay. Yeah, I know. So we're going to start. Let's start with the right. Let's start with the right. Okay. So when we graph X squared. We get a U shape, right? We're going from zero to two. So we're trying to find this area under the curve. If I partition this into two, now it tells me to do it a little bit different. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Sorry, this should be two over n. I think I said it, but didn't write it. If we partitioned it into two rectangles, this is just me talking, we're not doing two, we're doing two over n. These would be my rectangles. So is that a maximum or a minimum? It's gonna be a maximum, why? Because they're gonna be outside. So everybody understand that. So when I write big M sub I, Remember, it's going to equal A. So our formula told us A plus delta X I or I delta X. Our A is zero. Our delta X was two over M. So we get two I over M. So remember, I told you there'd be a time when you found that yourself. I gave it to you a minute ago. This is how you find it that way. All right. So now we have all the parts to be able to do our summation. We're going to start with one and go to N. F of your maximum value or your 2i over n times your delta x. What was our delta x? Mm -hmm. So this is your function times delta x. We found that last delta x was 2 fifths. This one is 2 over n because we don't know what our partitions are going to be. Okay. What is your function? X squared. So we're going to do it into our function squared. So 2i over n squared times delta x. <coughs> when I multiply this out, what do I? What do I get? What about this one? Just start with this. What do I get on the top? Four I squared and then times two is? Mm -hmm. Everybody okay with eight I squared? What will I get on the bottom? Close. 
Think about it. What am I doing to this one? Not plus in, but times in. Yeah. N cubed. So this is N squared because I had to square it, right? And then over here, I have another one. So that makes three of them. See, it's the little things that'll stress you out. How did I clean this up on that last one? What can I do? Think about your rules. Come on, guys. Yep, push your constant. No, not just eight. Eight over n cubed. Summation of n i equals one of i squared. What do I do now? Okay, remember n is going to be a constant anyway. We're plugging in for n all the time. Okay, so that we can find the summation. The constant doesn't matter in our summation, just like it doesn't matter in our derivatives, like it doesn't matter in our antiderivatives. We'll eventually multiply it back in. It's just like factoring it out so we don't have to deal with it. So what can I do now? For the I squared, right? So we get eight over N cubed. The summation of I squared is N n plus one, 2n plus one over six. So your book would go from this to the final answer. Done. So I have to work it out so that you guys can see it. So there's no Now we got to simplify, that's it. So at this point you're done except for simplification. So how do I simplify this? You can. I went ahead and took an N out because I see that we factored out an N in that second set of parentheses and there's an N cubed on the bottom in the first step. So that made it a little bit easier. So what I'm telling you is I have an N on top and three on bottom so I can simplify that. Again, it makes it just a little bit easier. I'm gonna leave this eight over N squared for a minute. I am going to go ahead and distribute this top. We get 2n squared I do n times 1 is 1n and 2n times 1 is 2n which makes 3n. Is everybody okay with that? And then 1 times 1 is 1 all over six. Yes, you would. Yep. And then I'm going to multiply it out and simplify it. So multiply the top. You get 16n squared plus 24n plus eight. And just to save a step, I'm going to write them all with the common denominator underneath them. They already understand that. So your common denominator is n squared times six or six n squared. And then when you simplify these, you're finished. What is 16 n squared over six n squared? Perfect. 24n over 6n squared. Four over n. Eight over 6n squared. Perfect. No, everything's good. So this is your maximum. The other one is the one that makes you want to shoot yourself. You ready? I make that steps. Just it's a little bit harder inside the function. So now we're going to do the left, which will be the minimum. So from that last one, it's 
to get the left, you're going to do I minus one delta x. That I minus one is what makes that order. Okay. That's what makes that order. Our A was zero. I minus one, our delta x was two over n. I'm going to clean that up. To be two I minus two over n. I have a question. Yep. Oh, yes. Do we get any kind of formula? Nope. At all? Nope. I lied to you for a minute. Go ahead and leave that two out. It actually makes it easier. That was the trouble that I had as I left the two in there. Can you leave the two in there? Absolutely. It's not going to hurt anything. It's a hard exam. It's a hard exam. All right. So now do the same thing that you did here. We're going to plug it into the function and then multiply it by delta x. So instead of writing that f of blah, 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 we're just going to go through it. We're doing 2 i minus 1 over n squared. So I plugged it into the function x squared. times delta x two squared is four i minus one squared over n squared times two over n Everybody okay with that? Work it out inside that I minus one. I'm going to have four times I squared minus two I plus one over n squared. Again, I just multiplied this i minus 1 squared out. And then on top, what's 4 times 2? Oh, yeah, that was a hard one. <laughs> Four times two is eight. And on the bottom, we're going to have n cubed. What did we do over here? What do we do right here? Pull out the eight n cubed. Is everybody good? What happens when I have add and subtract? What happens when I have add and subtract? Did you do the derivative of everything together or did you separate it? We separate it. So we're going to separate these. I'm not going to write it down that I separated it. So I'm going to kind of skip that step. What's your uh, summation of I squared? I'm not going to have that shape. Let me get a new one. You guys, I don't want you to squish it in. I'm going to try to finish this one before we get out of here. I squared was n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1 over 6. We're going to have minus 2. What's your summation of I?
Remember I told you we'd be using them, right? So as long as you know where to find them, it's n times n plus one over two. And then the summation of your constant is your constant times n. What time you'll get out of here? Yeah, we'll be good. All right. These twos are going to cancel out. We're going to simplify this. I'm going to leave the 8n cubed out for a minute. I'm going to make a common denominator. So this n plus one, 2n plus one. How do I make this a common denominator? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna rewrite that as the n squared plus n at the top so you guys can see it. And remember, I'm subtracting. I'm gonna do this all at one time. Subtract and a common denominator. So negative six n squared minus six n. How do I get this n to have a common denominator? Times it by six. And again, that gives me a common denominator of six. What do you see? Yeah, those will cancel out. Wait for just a second. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this out again. As long as you have these that are being multiplied, you can't take anything out because this n, it is with both of them. So as long as you took it out of both, you would be just fine. But I'm gonna go ahead and multiply it out. So n times two n is two n squared, but I have another n here, so two n cubed. n times one is one n times two n is three n. There's another n on the outside, so three n squared. One times one is one, so plus n minus six n squared. Your common denominator is six. Clean it up a little bit more. I have two n cubed. I have a plus three n minus six n is negative three n squared plus n all over six. I'm gonna pull this six out to make it a little bit easier. Why does that help me? I can reduce the six and the eight to be four thirds. And then I can distribute and reduce. So what is four times two n cubed? Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, we have 3n cubed. What is 4 times negative 3n squared? Uh -huh. And then 4 times n is over 3n cubed. And the last step is to simplify that. What's the first term simplified to? Second one. What kind of four? Negative. And then? Look at your, except for the minus and the plus. Okay. Very good. All right, we'll finish these up tomorrow. I don't know how long it will take.